you know, the, the old system is always trying to entice you into reacting or engaging in a way that doesn't feel good. What if just by observing what's going on, new possibilities and potentials start to show up to be able to show up in a new way that is going to help the whole system to change? Welcome to Safe Space Made Simple, a practical podcast that guides clinical leaders and healthcare managers to create trust and support with their teams. I'm your host, Trace Hobson. Join me for weekly interviews, practical tools, and inspiring transformational stories of bringing people together in healthcare. Now, let's dive in. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Safe Space Made Simple, the podcast that was created for clinical leaders, managers, and executives who want to generate a safe space for themselves and for their teams in healthcare. Now, if you're working in healthcare today, you are probably one of the people that are listening to this show that want to change the system from the inside out. And you probably want to create an environment where people feel excited to come to work, they feel safe with their team when they get there, and then they go home feeling energized by the meaningful work that they did for their time at work with people that they care about and that care about and support them. When we have that kind of an environment, we might leave work tired from a lot of things that we're doing, but we're also leaving energized for the rest of the areas of our life that we want to live and be our best in. To create that kind of environment, we need to shift our thinking and our own system so that we can have a systemic ripple effect on the people around us. And then we can invite others and enroll others into that same kind of dynamic so that we can experience a systemic shift. And that shift goes beyond just our workplace. The systems that we are experiencing in our body and in our lives and in our relationships happen everywhere. We're talking about our family systems. We're talking about our relational systems, our community systems, and we're talking about work. And the one constant, the one variable that's the same everywhere you go is you. I believe that systemic work starts from within our own neurobiological system. And when we become aware through presence, listening, and powerful questions, we can begin to work with that energy inside of us to have a very dynamic effect on the people around us and on the environments we are navigating all the time. And inevitably, when we are in those dynamic environments, those complex situations at work or at home, we're going to encounter disagreements and conflicts and resistances within ourselves that invite us to work with what's going on inside. But how do we actually do that? Several years ago, my family and I decided to do something intentional to change the relationship systems within our family with my sister, my mom, and my dad and I. We decided to create a Zoom call where we could come in and generate a safe space and then practice in those areas of resistance that came up for us as we did that. Well, in today's episode, I share one of the family calls that we recorded. We talk about the ways in which we're showing up with each other and how that's beginning to have a ripple effect on other parts of our family. We also talk about how to work with that resistance within ourselves so that we can do our inner work and lead from the inside out rather than looking outside of us and trying to control what's happening over there with people, places, and things or projects. This, this applies really well to systemic work at home or systemic work at work. The only system that you truly have any control over is your own. And I'm talking about your neurobiological system, your nervous system, the, the level of connection that you have and congruence and awareness you have inside with presence, listening, and powerful questions. As you work with that inner resistance, you begin to see a ripple effect that happens in your relationships as well as in collectives or teams or families. At least that's what we discovered in our family call and what I also discovered in my work in different organizations and in healthcare. Now, today's episode is also videotaped as well. So if you want to access through the YouTube channel, you can do that. That might be a bit more interesting for you to listen to and to watch. And in this episode, my sister and I have a conversation about a disagreement that comes up between us in this particular call. And we use that opportunity to flesh out 
a couple of different concepts, the Heisenberg principle, the uncertainty principle, as well as the four levels of engagement that was created by Alan Seal, the founder and director of the Center for Transformational Presence. In the conversation, I guide my sister through an exercise with this. And then we also reflect a little bit as a family about what this means and how we can apply this and what our experience is with it. Now, I'm trusting that you'll be able to translate this into your own context, whether it's your personal life or your professional life, whether it's your family system or it's your system at work. And as you're listening, if you have any questions, write them down and reach out to me on LinkedIn or by email, and I'll be glad to have a conversation with you. Now, without further ado, let's get right into the show. And so I want to revisit a tool, and that is the four levels of engagement. Because mm -hmm. whenever anything happens, we have the, the dialogue that's going on inside of us as things happen. So the first one is drama. And actually, if you've got a piece of paper, pull out a piece of paper and just draw a big yeah. box yeah. like this on it. So just like draw four quadrants just like oh, that. Okay. Sort of like a kind of like the Jahar Jaharhi window. Have you heard of that, Trace? Okay, so what you're doing right now, I'm gonna just point this out and be really overt with you. You're comparing what's happening in the now with something that is familiar for you from the previous or the past. Now there's nothing right. wrong with that, but what just notice that because there's an automatic resistance to something new happening whenever you compare it with something old. Well, I wouldn't call it resistance necessarily. So I think it's also locating myself in the new. Right. So learning forward is learning from a completely right. clear space compared to learning from what you've learned before, because that defines it in a way that maybe cuts off new awarenesses because you can only see it through the Jahard model, or you can only see, oh, that reminds me of that time back in, you know, 94 when I did this, or that reminds me, there's not, this is not wrong. There's nothing wrong. It's just that it does define things from the past learning rather than from the present, which is now letting go of, one of the standards that often happens in spaces is that, um, we learn forward, not backwards. So that means that even mm -hmm. though it's the it's the uh, mind of the beginner or the mind of the child as well, which means that you let go of anything you know about a subject to discover something new. Does that make sense? It does. I I don't know if I agree with your perspective. Wow. So you don't agree with I'm me? Of it. <laughs> Well, I just know, I know you are very solution and forward orientated, and I am very past and or origin orientated. Mm -hmm. So for me to understand something, I, I always draw from what I know. And I think it's almost impossible to not have some kind of colored lens on when you're learning. Because well, really? your past will always inform what you're doing. Who you are today is based on what you've experienced. So in quantum physics, they talk about um, just trying to look up the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the Heisenberg un uncertainty principle is the idea that you, you cannot measure location and speed at the same time. You can only, and, and you can look this up, the, the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is that you can only measure location or speed. You can't measure both at the same time. So what that creates is this idea that um, things are either in stasis and frozen so that you can analyze them, or they're in flow and wave form so that they're moving. Mm -hmm. And so we do this really subtly in our thinking with many different things. Perception and reality are shaped by what I'm describing right now. So when you look at something that's happening in the now and you define it to ground yourself for whatever reason, again, none of it's wrong. It's not about it being wrong. It's just about noticing the dynamics and the way, the qualities of with which something's happening in this, in this present moment. 
So if you can't measure the location and the speed of something at the same time, you have to choose either location or speed. Speed is wave form, location is particle form. In quantum physics, they say that when you measure the location, you're looking at the particular location and it's in a frozen state. When you measure the speed, it's in wave form and it's moving. So when you work with energy, especially energy in a dynamic like a situation or a team or a group, within yourself, there's decisions you're making about whether or not something's being frozen in form, particle, or you're letting go of it being a certain way so that you can be with your own sort of judgment of that and observe that. It's like you said, well, last week I was the observer as they were all talking and they were like mm -hmm. not even including me in that situation. Now, in the old days, you could have frozen that and made that a certain way. This is bullshit because it, you're doing this, mm -hmm. but you didn't do that. You let go of it being a certain way so that you could observe it and le let it be in waveform until you could work with the energy into a point where you decided, hey, actually, I have some feelings about this. And I think it's important that I use my voice and show up in the fullness of who I am without my mom role mm -hmm. and do and say this, which is exactly what I'm talking right. about. That's now the, the difference between content and process. Ex yeah, exactly. So the, the, the process is this practice of presence. Mm -hmm. And the content is the definitions and judgments we're making inside of ourselves all the time. My, my invitation to you is to notice those judgments and, and the way that we're, you're defining it inside of a group setting and to let go of it having to be a certain way. And, can, and there's a tension there, for, at least there is for me. I know that for me, it does feel like resistance. Resistance is the perfect word because I have this idea about what's happening. And then I realize, oh, wait a second, actually, my idea maybe isn't accurate. Maybe it isn't like, so I got to let go of the definitions so that I can discover something brand new. And this is how you get into working with mm -hmm. what's in your blind spots, because your blind spots are what you don't know about what you don't know. Right. You know what you know, right? Mm -hmm. You know what you've learned. I have a I have a negative view of what resistance looks like because it means that I'm not cooperating and I'm not willing to look at things. But I, I don't look at it that way. Well, so that's and really that, interesting. That, that feels uncomfortable to me. Right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So even in this moment, as you define resistance as a negative thing, the dynamic of what I'm describing is happening right now inside of you. Right. right. No, I understand it. I just, I would like to reframe it so that I don't feel uncomfortable or because the reality is, yes, maybe I noticed content as I was entering into process, mm -hmm. but does, that doesn't mean I'm resisting the process. I'm just noticing the content. Right. And so that feeling inside of you that even is happening right now, what if that's actually a co-creative partner? Maybe. And so what becomes possible if it's a co-creative partner and not about whether or not you're doing something right or wrong? It's the label that, for me, that's content oriented. So when you label it as resistance, mm -hmm. it's content. And my past grid is deciding. Right. Right. About the process. So what if it was labeled as noticing? Well, I probably wouldn't have had the same response. Yeah. Can you possibly pick all the right labels for all the right people all the time? No. Right. <laughs> right. But so as soon as as soon as I said something, you're you you coined it as resistance, which I had a reaction to. Right. Right. So what was that like for you to have that reaction? And even in this conversation now, how are you feeling inside? Because I wanna I wanna argue with the label. I wanna argue with your perception of what you see it as because I don't agree with it. Right. And, and so as an approach, how's that working for you? What do you mean as an approach? Because I'm not really approaching it. 
I'm just disagreeing. Well, if you want to argue with somebody, then yes, that's an approach for sure. That's a, that is a definition of what's going on and you're deciding, nope, I'm not. I, just- I want to be, yeah, I want to be, I want to be seen or ensure that I'm seen accurately. That's important to me. So what do you need right now in this moment? For my brother not to think that I'm being resistant. <laughs> does it matter what I think, though? It does to me. Does it? Deeply. Yes. Well, so if we let go of the definition of resistance and what you've learned about that definition, and you make a choice right now. So let's just use this. Actually, this model is great. So the four levels of engagement is about four different things that happen. The first, the first grid or the first box is drama. And that's just a word that's used to describe our initial reaction to something, our initial sort of visceral, I don't fucking like that, you know, sort of feeling. Yeah. Right. Kind of that's my drama around the label resistance. Right. Got it. So so <laughs> in that box, what happens a lot of the time is we right away um define something as either right or wrong, good or bad. That's the drama quadrant. That's what happens. And we often will want to either point a finger at somebody else or at ourselves and say, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pushing against energy. It's like pushing against, it's, you're going mm-hmm. upstream at that point. That's how it feels, right? So that's drama. Then you move into the next quadrant, which is situation. And situation is very similar to drama, except it's, it's a very intellectualized approach to fixing this problem. This is a problem. Mm-hmm. It's okay, because we have at least 100 different ways to solve this. Here, let's go to this. And so situation is all about solving the problem as quickly and efficiently as possible so that we can get people to um, see things the way that we we see them or the way that we want them to see it them. And mm-hmm. so then we go to the next part, which is choice. And choice is not, it's a quantum step from situation to choice. And it's not about whether or not something's right or wrong, good or bad. It's about who is it that I choose to be in this situation? And who is this situation actually developing me to be? That's a different kind Mm -hmm. of question that's, that's asked at that point compared to the first two quadrants. And then the last one is, hey, what if this is a vehicle for my consciousness and my evolution, what's the opportunity here for me? So let's just walk this through with this particular issue, just as an example. And this will be a good practice round for what's going to come up in the next call, because it's just the way it is. This is just what happens for people. (laughs) You know, we have lots of definitions for things and none of them are wrong. It's just something to be curious about and to notice. So if you take a deep breath, and even with your little grid in front of you, you've got those four quadrants. The first one is drama. So put your finger in that first mm-hmm. one, drama. And this is the situation that we just had, or not situation, but this is the interaction we just had about the word resistance and the definition mm-hmm. of that. So what did you, so just take a deep breath into drama and how that felt for you in your body and in your reaction. What was that, what mm-hmm. did that feel like for you when it first happened? I was angry. Yes. Okay. And frustrated. Okay. So take a deep breath into that and just notice that. What was some of the language that was there in that quadrant in your mind? Those are really that you don't understand me and you're judging me. Got it. So just take a moment. And how does that feel in your body when you consider all of that? It's very like heavy and constricting. Got it. So take your finger off do this just kind of (laughs) wipe it off and now put your finger in situation which is the next part of this which is okay i'm feeling all of this heaviness and i'm going to fix this quick i don't i'm going to fix it so take a deep breath into situation and notice the way it feels to now to 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 intellectually fix this problem Mm -hmm. and take a deep breath into that now, how does that feel when you take a deep breath into that? 
in some ways, it's a little bit liberating because I feel the opportunity to explain myself. Right. So it does feel like it's a little bit less heavy than drama. And then you start to explain yourself. So you used some of the words and some of the things and the model of the different things. So take a deep breath into now you're explaining. And how does that feel as you are explaining? It's still somewhat frustrating. Right. So just notice because that. Because I don't think my needs, my needs are being met. Right. Exactly. Totally get that. So take your hand off of that. Shake that off. That's a visceral kind of example of how that feels. Now we're going to take a quantum leap into choice. So put your finger in choice and take a deep breath into who you choose to be and who this situation is developing you to be as a human being. Take a deep breath. It was right there and then you let it go. Who do you choose to be in this particular situation? And who do you notice that this is actually developing you to be? Well, I choose to be open and connected and honest. And then what it's developing me to be is open. Within and, and notice that it's actually this. Just take a deep breath into openness and connection and honesty. And also using your voice too. And how does that feel in your body? It's very pivotal for me because I don't, I think I get stuck here sometimes. Well, and it's also still sometimes scary, which yeah. is to, which is appropriate because having a safe space doesn't necessarily mean that you feel safe. It means that you're safe to be who you are. Yeah. The choice for me is whether or not I'm willing to let you see my anger, my frustration, and my discomfort. Right. Like the first two quadrants, whether I'm willing to let you see that, to truly see it. Right. And so if you connect to like a higher frequency of information, what do you notice that God is doing in this for you at a higher level? Who is that higher being creating and, and developing you to be? Are you talking about the choice still? Yes. Or opportunity? Choice. The choice. To be more open and like willing to let people see me. Willing to let you see me and trust you. Now move your hand over into the opportunity now and take a deep breath into opportunity and really just take a moment and close your eyes and ask this whole process, what is this a vehicle for? that's serving in the highest and best good for you. And then breathe to listen. I think for me in particular, what came to me was this permission around, it's okay to be angry in, in my relationship. Mm -hmm. It's okay to like have those feelings. Right. Permission why is, giving. Why is, like, it okay? why is it okay? Because I have like prevented myself from how like sharing that with within my relationships with people right yeah and i what do you believe about people's responsibility their innate responsibility i think that if i get angry that um they're going to feel the need to like apologize and take responsibility for me mm -hmm. like i believe about right. my responsibility to others right which also is connected to that whole piece about perception too, because as you believe that it also shapes the way that people show up for you, because that's your perception of what's going on. But as soon as you go, okay, wait a second, I'm actually responsible to be who I am, to be open, to be connected, to be real, to be truthful. Now, I don't know that you always just share all of that with anybody, but definitely you need to be connected to that. And you're responsible for being the caretaker of all of that. That's your work. That's not my work, right? Like you would never expect mm -hmm. Trace to take responsibility for your feelings, right? You would actually, no. you, would, you do a great job of doing that. And so what about what becomes possible if I'm responsible for my feelings in interacting with you? And if you show up and you're angry, 
and that uh, you know i have a i have an experience with that that's actually mine that's not yours i think it it feels very risky to trust that others have the maturity true i don't trust that people have the ability to handle that right well what if even if they don't that's actually the fastest route for them to develop that muscle <laughs> it's uncomfortable it is isn't it <laughs> it is yeah it really is uncomfortable and this is systemic work that's happening from inside of you because as you work with that uncomfortable feeling that's going on inside of you and you really begin to have a dialogue with it, it does give everybody around you the right and responsibility of their own experience, regardless of whether or not they can handle it, handle it, which is also a definition, by the way, handle it or not, mm -hmm. because that's going to actually, that's their evolutionary tension that they are going to grow under, right? Like how does the butterfly yeah. actually fly away from the cocoon if you help the butterfly get out the butterfly can't fly it dies if you don't help it it actually flexes and moves and struggles and struggles and it finally gets out and that blood coursing through its wings now gives it flight because of the struggle to get out otherwise it doesn't same thing here especially mm -hmm. with people you love because if I have a problem with what you've said to me, whose problem is that? It's yours. It is, isn't it? But I, I feel kind of I feel kind of proud of myself because I was willing to risk it with you and trust that you'd be able to hold space for me. Right. Right. But if <laughs> and that's awesome. I, I I also acknowledge that. And that's really powerful what you just said and what you did. And there are times when regardless of whether or not somebody can handle it, I'm still responsible to be honest and open and trust a bigger power yeah. than that other person because, you know, that mm -hmm. other person may not have the capacity, but they, but what wants to happen might be for me to say something that is going to be uncomfortable for them and for me. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I think part of the <laughs> journey is that, yeah. You know, how does that feel for yeah. you? I, I I agree. And it's very freeing, you know, like I, in the moment, it's not always that freeing. <laughs> you know? No, it feels like. But it, I, I, like I get it intellectually, but in the moment, it's super, it's like there's a tension there, right? This is why I call it resistance, because for me, I'm resisting this natural flow of what wants to happen because I am uncomfortable or I am anticipating the other person is going to be uncomfortable and I'm filtering myself and I'm sort of dampening who I am to try and manage that. That never works. It's mm -hmm. always exhausting and I'm resist. I'm getting in my own way. You know what I mean? So that's why yeah. I call it resistance. Yeah, it makes sense now that I understand your definition of it. Yeah. Topping like it does. Like so it makes total sense. Hey, just a quick pause to today's podcast. Are you having a challenge as a clinical leader with one or more individuals who you find activate you on your team? Or maybe you're noticing that oftentimes you want to be able to communicate with people, but in the, the heat of the moment, it's difficult for you because you're having a difficult time regulating yourself. Well, I totally understand this. This has been some of the biggest challenges in my life as a leader and as a human being. And so I created a free resource for clinical leaders, nurse educators, and healthcare executives called the Relationship Regulator. It's a mini course that will show you step-by-step -step a framework that may serve you very powerfully in this area. So if you want to download the Relationship Regulator for free, click in the show notes and you'll find that resource for you today. Now, back to the show. We're tapping into some universal principles here that have nothing to do with me or you. They're at a higher level. Like you, you and back to the, the Heisenberg principle, you can't measure the location and the speed at the same time 
And so that asks us to let go of locating and defining something and just allow it to be in waveform. That tension inside of you is like tempting you to like define it or to like lock mm -hmm. it down. But then you just was, you were like leaving it. No, I'm not going to go there. That's good. That's a trap. I'm not going to go there. And then <laughs> it, what emerged was this other dynamic where you could actually show up. This is why for me, that four breath practice of acknowledging, appreciating, accepting, and allowing are so key in this because what we're doing with this, these two models, the four levels of engagement and the four breaths, is we're slowing down a, a something that's already happening inside of us. And we're like watching mm -hmm. it at a very slow speed so that when it happens in real time, we can start to notice our own, oh, I'm in drama with that. I'm actually reacting with that. That's acknowledgement. It's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I recognize that. And then appreciating how my old way of dealing with that and coping with that mm -hmm. has really helped me to get to where I am here now. And also even just aware that that just is happening. Holy cow. Like I can appreciate mm -hmm. that evolutionary tension inside of me. And I can accept this. I can accept what's happening. I can accept that my sister right now is a little bit out of sorts with the way that I'm speaking. That's a problem for her. I can tell she's having a problem with me or what I've said. And so I can accept and let go of having to have that be different in any way. That's not easy work. That's actually like... I mean, I love my sister. I don't want her. I don't. Same things go inside me too, but I'm just going, okay, I acknowledge that. I appreciate that that old way used to work. I'm going to accept it and let go of it having to be different in any way. And now I've created a safe space for me and for you to show up in the fullness of who we are, not comfortable. And I'm allowing what it is that wants to happen on a higher level to the best of my ability. Now, on a good day, in a good moment, you know, this is a practice. This mm -hmm. is not, you know, a linear thing. This is a very dynamic, flowing thing that's always happening. What are you making of this, Ma? I love it. I think of so many times where uh, I've been in the drama and the situation, and I've explained myself and and kept quiet. Um and it's like a piece of you just goes away. Mm. And, and you, afterwards you think, oh, you know, I just, just should have said something. I didn't gain anything by, by trying to manage the situation. And I didn't manage the situation. And um, I didn't show up the way I want to. I, I didn't say that in the past. but uh, And you do yourself a disservice. Uh, you walk away from the situation or the conversation and you say, oh, I wish I'd done that better. So you kind of get down on yourself. The other dynamic with that is that you definitely do yourself a disservice, but I think that what's really dropped for me the last couple of years with this is that because I love people and want to support people to be their best too, I used to think that by trying to manage the situation, I was somehow helping others. But in fact, I'd get the opposite result and then be completely confused because I'm trying to help. But even though it's uncomfortable, what I'm noticing more and more is that it actually serves the other human being way more when I stop trying to control what's going on and really let go of it and to the best of my ability, practice presence from the inside out if that makes sense yeah yeah it does yeah it's quite liberating there's a lot of relief <laughs> yeah there is a lot of relief isn't there whether we even have an opinion I, I i certainly understand and see that that there are times when you <laughs> a conversation where i don't really need to be here <laughs> But I also know that, and and out of all of this, one thing I can kind of grab hold of is uh, letting go. 
like the letting go part. I I have found in my life that letting go has been one of the greatest tools and and positive movements that I've ever been able to take care of or or be a part of. You know, uh, letting go is is so much easier than fighting. <laughs> fighting is usually not very productive. <laughs> no. no, fighting against anything is resistance, and it isn't productive, it's not good for us, and it isn't natural for us either. And out of it all, you want to be able to have an expression of your own opinion, but you want to be able to do that safely. Hmm. And lots of times, if you're, you need to think ahead a little and... and uh, if you realize that that expression of your opinion is going to harm or hurt or not be productive, not be worthwhile, then it's best to just let it go. And, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, chances are other opportunities will come up anyway. Well, I really feel like safety, the way we're describing it, is um, different than what is typically talked about as safety in a safe space in the world because. The misconception is that a safe space means that I'm going to always feel safe, and that's not true, right? The truth is that a safe space is about me showing up in the fullness of who I am and speaking out what it is that I feel compelled to say. And I was conditioned for a long time to believe that I couldn't do that. It wasn't okay for me to do that. So a safe space feels a bit counterintuitive because... I want to feel safe, but at the same time, speaking my truth oftentimes feels risky or scary, right? So that's a that's a bit of a, a misconception. And then I go, okay, well, feeling safe is about generating safety from within me as I listen and work with the energy of what's going on in any given situation. The relief that I began to feel when I work in this way inside of myself generates safety for me, regardless of what's going on for the other people around me. That's a big, important piece, I think, for me, because then it's not about what you do or say, it's about me and how I generate my own safe space. Now, I also have the benefit of, you know, choosing to have support from people that are like minded and are holding a space for me and all of that's true, too. So I don't want to, you know, minimize that because I think that's really important, too. But ultimately, we all stand somewhat alone in life and have to actually stand on our own two feet and go, all right, here I am, you know, and being secure within myself, I found, comes from generating a safe space in the way that we're describing it today on this call. It seems like generating a safe space is um, allowing yourself to show up authentically without any pretext. Yeah, like that's easy. <laughs> right? Like you come up against yourself all the time. I come up against myself all the time with that. You know, yeah. the tricky part is I don't even know that it's there. I was, I'm in my blind spot. And sometimes when you're in a family, uh, you've got these systems going that you've done for years and years and years. Um, so they, you, you can step in line or you can show up. So I, I, I really feel like what you're saying now is very important for seeing how to change a family system. And it's done in a very different way than I think that I've heard, ever heard before in the world. So as those family systems of communication and interactions are going on and they're not, they don't feel good, they don't, they're not working, and you feel like it's risky to to show up in the fullness of who you are, being able to slow down to the speed of your presence and observe all of, the, all of that 
and to work with the energy inside of you in that moment and acknowledge it and appreciate it and accept it allows something new to happen. You know, the, the old system is always trying to entice you into reacting or engaging in a way that doesn't feel good. What if just by observing what's going on, new possibilities and potentials start to show up to be able to show up in a new way that is going to help the whole system to change? They might not like it. <laughs> well, let's talk about us. Did we like it at first? Did you guys like it at first when we started working this way? five years ago right? not at all yeah and yet man, i'm pretty grateful we did so i want to acknowledge alan seal and the work that he does with this because what i love about alan's work is that he brought it down into really simple forms and the four levels of engagement is an example of the one of those forms you know drama situation choice opportunity helps to really define very quickly what it is that's going on inside of us and i think that because of the simplicity and the power of those tools um his work has been very pivotal for me and really helpful for me to put language to this we get ready to go into another call in a half an hour how does that feel for you Kim? i'm trying to to, to think about it too much and I'm I'm trusting that I'll be able to show up in the moment um, just because I feel like I'm I'm I want things to be different for me in this system so I'm really focusing on my own energy and what I want to bring right so I'm nervous a little nervous mm -hmm. but also feeling like I have a lot of resolve like to to be present and to like be authentic. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think everybody feels that way on that call that they want things to be different as well. And everybody's doing what they do to try to get that to happen. Yeah, it's interesting. Cause I mean, that like you talked, you, you explained it really nicely with the point of slowing down and why that's important. And uh, in order to be able to like notice it when you're in the moment of those like being um, aware and you can't do that unless you slow down and you actually kind of recognize what's happening. And I, I really noticed when you left the call that the pace like really amped up. Yeah, there was some discomfort with the idea of it being slow, I think. For who? For you or for others? I think just for our whole system my whole system with me and the kids like it just felt like that was that was difficult but it, it definitely challenged the system two things so the, the letting go of the agenda is for me a constant practice all the time it's like and i don't even realize i have a hold of the agenda until i look down and i go oh i have an agenda again it's there again where did it come from? My hands were just empty a second ago, and now they're filled with an agenda again. What the actual F. So that letting go of the agenda is always happening, and it's happening from my blind spots a lot of the time. Um, even in my definitions of how things are happening, and this is where it's very subtle, like when I define things from my previous experiences and all those different things, it's like my agenda of how, how this is occurring for me, right? And so letting that go is a constant practice. And then I realized that it's not my agenda that is the most powerful part of who I am. It's not my words. It's not my strategy. It's none of those things. It is my presence. It's being who I am in the moment that I'm in. So dad, when you were saying earlier, yeah, I don't know if I need to be in this conversation, the way that you're showing up with you is the most powerful gift that you have to bring. And it's the most powerful gift that any one of us has to bring. That's why prayer is so powerful. It's not because of how you say the prayer. It's that you're being in presence 
with what is in the highest and best good of the people, the situations, mm -hmm. your life. So this is the practice of presence when you're in a group that we're going to be in in a few minutes, you know, same thing. All right. At the end of this call, what I'm taking away today is. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I, I came out of this whole thing with this uh, choice being basically an expression of opinion. I mean, you have a choice. We all have a choice and we all have an opinion. And, and, and to be able to express that opinion in safety is pretty paramount, it's pretty big deal. And, and it occurred to me just listening to you two that there is an expression of safety and, and comfort that gives you the ability to express your opinion. Just watching you two, even though Kim was angry a little bit, and sometimes Chase was a little anxious because he didn't like that. He did the last thing in the world he wants to see is you be mad at him. I understand that so well. You've accomplished so much in your relationship. It's really a privilege to watch and be a part of. That's what I'm digging away. I'm taking away that Joe is a gift. Uh, I'm taking away I, that it's okay to be a, li a living example <laughs> of process and that I can only control myself. Yeah, I'm taking away that we can trust a higher power that has our backs no matter what. Mm -hmm. You know, I really rely on that. And the older I get, the more it seems that I rely on that. You know, I don't need to understand. I don't need to do anything. I just need to trust. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, I love you guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for listening. I'm trusting that that episode served you and that you're going to be able to pull some nuggets out of there that will help you at work or at home. And again, if you have any questions that bubbled up for you during this episode, feel free to reach out to me by email or on LinkedIn. Thanks again so much for listening and supporting this work. And remember to be a safe space. Thank you again for getting to the end of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this and you found that there was value in it for you, my invitation is for you to subscribe for future episodes that come out weekly on Tuesdays. Thank you again. And I'm looking forward to being with you next time. Now remember to be a safe space.